welcome to Kids Book Buzz, a children's book club where you read the book in the spotlight and submit any questions you have about the book or for the creative to CBCAWA. I'm your host, Kirsty Lightfoot, Vice President of CBCAWA, and today we're exploring The Raven Song, which is co-written by the fabulous Bren McDibble. Welcome, Bren. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsty. Thanks for inviting me. So nice to connect. Uh, Bren McDibble is an incredible children's author of powerful junior novels that look at the world we could be facing in the future and the children who are empowered enough to change it. The Raven Song is a massive story spanning three time points and was a collaboration between Santa Fralian and Bren. The Raven Song was shortlisted and was an honor book in 2023 Book of the Year Young Readers and will be our book in the spotlight today. I'm so excited to deep dive into it. Are you ready to talk all the Raven Song again? Let's talk about it. It's very exciting <laughs> at the moment because it just got shortlisted for our New South Wales Premiers Award. I did just say that. Congratulations. Well, speaking of the awards, because you've been shortlisted on it and now nominated again, um, what does the CBCA shortlist and the Honour Award, what did it mean to you in 2023 and what does it still mean to you now? Look, it's, it's a great award because it... Um, gets the book highlighted and it gets um, it gets it put in front of not only bookshop owners and parents but also teachers and librarians which means um, you know highlights the good points about it and the talking points about it and that gets the teachers and librarians involved in using it in classrooms and stuff so it kind of gives it this burst of life and activity that you know you can't get there with traditional marketing and um, yeah it's just really amazing to see it just even get shortlisted just to give that little prop up. How important is it to have organisations like CBCA like around for yourself and the creators? Because you've had other awards and nominations and things like that, like, and you've obviously been nominated um, again recently for another award. So how do those organisations help you and are important to you? Yeah, well, the CBCA is all about children. So it's all about what is great for children, but it's also about what is um what is relevant in our society and our culture and Australian society and culture because they only recommend um, Australian children's books. So um, I think it's, it's really, really imperative that we do celebrate Australian culture and children's books and children get to see themselves living their own lives. I mean, I never had that as a child until Margaret Mahi got, got going and then you know, the first time I read a Margaret Mahi book in New Zealand, I was like, this is set in New Zealand. This could actually happen. Because <laughs> I read some of her very scary YAs first. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> Always a way to start, um, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and it, there's a lot of children's books that come in and they're fast and they're fun and they're kind of cheap and they flood in from the UK and the US. And, and I think um, having the CBCA lifts it lifts our books up alongside theirs you know all that hype about um captain underpants or whatever yeah. i mean every <laughs> I guess book has... levels the playing field a little bit <laughs> yeah I was say, every book has its place but i have noticed and i do think it's organizations and this kind of continual award and building of creatives and the network you see more australian like i'm seeing more australian commercialized which is good like instead of it just being Captain on pants and just uk books like you can yeah go into yeah. bookstores and i mean our local independent bookstores are incredible for it but like there's just this celebration of australian literature which i think is yeah the conversation yeah. that's now being had because we've got incredible writers around australia and in wa we're very lucky so <laughs> yeah and then some of these books um get made into movies um and kids get to see themselves on the screen living australian lives and that's always wonderful too it is beautiful well, The Raven Song, I loved. It's an incredible story and it changes characters, time points, and the written POV as well, how you guys have stylized the book. Where did the idea for this story start? It just started with uh, conversations back and forth. Uh, me and Zana on Twitter, just talking back and forth and back and forth about what we wanted to do. She was she was stuck on a novel and she put a call out on Twitter, can someone help me with the next line? And she gave a line and I tried to help her, but it was completely wrong. And she just, offhand comment, she just said, that's not it, but I want to write that book with you. And then that's how it started. I waited a few months and then I came back and said, are you serious about wanting to write a book together? So we started talking about what we were interested in. And at the time I was in the mood to write about a world in recovery 
you know, because I'd writ written a lot where the world had already broke down. But I wanted to write a world in recovery where the humans had learned to step back and let the world recover. And she wanted to write um, the, the time just before that where the world was still breaking down. Um, with, yeah, you know, the end of civilization, what brought it about. So we decided that we would um, add in a pandemic as well as pollution and all that sort of stuff because, I mean, that was common. This was pre-COVID. Yeah, you so, guys managed to hit it, like, early. Yeah. <laughs> well, some say we caused it, but that's not true. <laughs> but, yeah, we, um, yeah we, we made a kind of a bird flu. Um, bird flu is like 50% death rate or something ridiculous it's it's even it can in humans it can be even worse than covid so we'd made this bird flu um which is in the news at the moment because uh, they've been feeding dairy cows birds in the u.s and the dairy cows have bird flu and mm -hmm. the first dairy the first dairy worker has now caught bird flu from a cow so the virus is learning to jump between um species so that's fun. Um, not no. very scary. Um, so. Yeah, so we, we'd, we'd put in this um, end of cities. I just basically wanted to end cities and send everybody back out to the Shire. I mean, a little bit of Tolkien. Send everybody back to little farmlets where they let the earth feel. Yeah, so we kind of tried to make a story that would work that way. And Zana took the past, which is the current time and I took the future because I love writing in the future even though it was kind of a a return to a more simple kind style of living um and then as Zana was writing it she came up with um she came up with this third character in the past and then it became this overarching theme arching theme of a um ancestors through time and things that happen time and time again and, you know, do do we learn our lessons through time kind of thing? And are we being the good ancestor to the next, you know, 100 years down the track? What will people look back and think about us? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. And I think it's something, you know, kids do think about. People don't think kids do, but they, they do because they start to see what they're getting now and what they have their yeah, ideas around. Yeah, what they've world. inherited. So yeah, yeah, it does come up as something that, you know, we are all global citizens and how does that look? So I think it's a really important um, novel because kids are thinking it, so they get to yeah, explore kids, it kids in a safe thinking. space. Yeah, yeah. When, you, when you write a book about it, they get to talk about it within the book and they get to think about it and, you know, and otherwise they might not ever have that chance to sit down and really think about these things. They just niggle at them and they go, whoa. Why is the world like that? Why were people so greedy in the past? And they're sitting there thinking all these thoughts. But then if you turn it, you know, you can turn it back around, like what will you do for the next generation as well? I mean, they've been handed a bad lot, this current generation, really. They've been handed an earth in turmoil and they've got a lot of work to do. So I don't think that thinking about how, how these things came about and how they could be changed, I don't think... Any time doing that will be wasted, no. and it also gives them a language to language to use when they think about it. I think, right. and that's important. And rather than turning away like they have been, I mean, yeah. you know, this generation is very good at turning away. Oh, it never happen. Seas will never rise. Yeah, we can't. <laughs> we can't about? do that. <laughs> we can't do that anymore. Sorry, <laughs> no, not at all. No. And I mean, the, the loop and like you said, that like learning through time and do we learn through time is just incredible. So. What was the process? We got the idea. What was the process of writing dual uh, like narratives well, and you guys writing alongside each other? We had to plan to a certain point. We we figured out there would be this point where they came together. So the kid from the past and the kid from the future would come together at this point. And we didn't know anything after that point. But um we knew we would be writing chapter about and we knew we wanted two distinct voices. So we went away. And we wrote until that point where they came together. And then we came back together and I slotted the chapters in one after the other. And all I had to do was split one of Zana's chapters to fit mine. Worked perfectly. The timing was perfect. It was like our 
our brains were in sync or something. You know? There was a higher power saying, this is your pacing. Or we just write the similar pacing. I don't know. But we came together at exactly the same point and it worked. And I showed Zana and she was like, holy moly. Got so then, then we just sent it back and forth between each other. And when Zana got to my character, she would write in the dialogue for my character that she wanted and she would send it to me and she just goes, oh, I've ruined, you know, I've ruined the dialogue so you just rewrite it how you want. And she she always um, made my character like super busy and loud and talkative and I'm like, oh, <laughs> is that how I write? <laughs> so that was funny and it was, yeah. So we just sent it back and forth and we would edit, edit a chapter, throw it back. And, I mean, it took months to turn around that way, but it COVID had set in by then. So Zana was locked down and, like, I was just doom scrolling um, through through the lockdown, which we actually didn't really have up here in Calberry. But um, <laughs> I was kind of just doom scrolling and, and, and it gave me something to do. Um, yeah. And I was writing this world in recovery and then we were seeing it playing out. In COVID, like, yeah, the air quality around the planet improved because people stayed home. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. It all happened yeah. so fast. It was pretty incredible, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The timing of it was incredible. And obviously, like, it sounds like it was a fun process. Like, it, it's obviously different to how you write a book. So it becomes a bit more social, yeah. it more of a teamwork thing. And it does sound like it was quite a fun way to write a story. And you can't not write because Zana's there waiting for it to come yeah. back. So it, it was kind of really <laughs> motivational. <laughs> I'll never have deadlines. My brother just, just go, oh, don't worry. You just get it to us when okay. you get it to us. <laughs> oh, fabulous. Yeah, so it I was mean, really, really good. It, do, it does sound like such a joy. And like like you said, quite a harmonious process as well, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, we really we really think alike, I think. It makes me quite, I think it, it flows. I mean, the book it flows so well it's just so amazing how it has all come together so I think that is telling of the process that it was so harmonious because it just yeah, flows so yeah. beautifully yeah, so- we we, yeah. we didn't know if we would even get along because we haven't met in real life no at that haven't. point so we you didn't even now, know haven't you yeah we met um just before the book hit the shelves actually in Melbourne we just got together for a few hours and had a lunch but uh, <laughs> that's basically it so we didn't know if we would even get along as people. Yeah. Um, so there was this pull-out clause that either of us could dump and run at any time if we didn't want to do it. So, But it continued and now we've got this masterpiece, which we're so lucky for. I know. <laughs> I know. We, well, we feel really, really lucky to have um, stumbled upon it. <laughs> yeah, we're lucky too. There are so many themes in this book that look at the world around us, like we've always talked about the pandemic and then being able to see that play out. It, it was just an interesting timing, um, climate change. Like you said, communities as well and bringing us back to smaller, simple living. Why yeah. do you think it's so important to have these themes in children's books? And I mean, I ask you this question because I know you're such an advocate for giving information to kids. So I'd love to hear you kind of explain why you do that and what's, what's the importance well, I think the kids see it in the news. Um, probably the news is probably the worst place because it's so sensationalised and scary. So I think kids see these topics in the news and I don't think the news is for kids. Um, yeah. But um, so I think it's important to talk about these things and then think about other ways of living and more kindly ways of living because if you're only presented with one style of living, you you don't know any different, do you? You can't. The idea of breaking out and living a more harmonious life with the planet might be might be a really strange idea that you're never ever presented with your whole life until you know you're an adult and you start thinking about these things and seeking them out. And it could be fifty or sixty before you do that. Who knows? But um, yeah, it's good to put these ideas out there um, just to get kids muscles working and thinking different different ideas accepting different ideas and learning about things um and fiction is such a safe space to do that rather than scaring them with the news um yeah they just kind of exercise those muscles learn the language learn a language that they can use the last kind of question i have before we jump into some of our other questions around like food because of our funding and some final four questions but 
we've kind of touched on a lot of the the what kids can get out of the book um what would you love readers to take away like if there's one thing that you're like this is what I would love every reader to take away I mean every book is different in for every reader but is there something that you kind of go I would love people to take that away from the book yeah um Zana kind of coined this you know just um be good ancestors <laughs> And I think that's probably the lesson for this generation is having had bad ancestors who um, are all about economic growth and take, take, take and haven't taken regard for the planet. I think it's the lesson for the generation is just be good ancestors. Now, I'm able to chat to you because of this funding we've been getting to run these um chats and to talk about the shortlist of 2023 and um we're so lucky to kind of have that partnership with healthway and they do their program fuel to go and play so we've inserted this like question section about snack attacks which is kind of about food and movement and fuel and all the good things around like healthy lifestyles so my question to you complete pivot i know from the ravens yeah. no i love it favorite like go-to meal something that sustains you fuels you comforts you whatever it is like what's your kind of go-to balanced meal well I read that um you have to have really good gut health in order to keep your brain working in order to keep your immune system working in order to keep your body working and the thing that guts really love is a huge variety of fruits and vegetables and I have to say it's I'm passionate about this because I am a whole food plant-based eater. So I don't eat processed foods, don't eat added sugar, don't eat added oil. It's all plants, vegetables, legumes, and grains. And I am really like thriving. I just, I just feel 10 years younger since I've uh, adopted this diet a few years ago. And I just, I can't recommend it enough. And I'm really glad I get to talk about it. So my (laughs) favorite (laughs) go-to is... Um, a curry because you yeah. can pack so much in so like you get you know you can be a, a sweet potato based curry but then you can throw in red lentils or chickpeas or um, lots of different vegetables you can chuck greens in there you can get all the herbs in there I love throwing mint in for a pop of freshness and um, a bit of uh, coriander because I love that taste it doesn't taste soapy to me um you get your your garlic and your onions, which is so good for your gut, and you get um, ginger, which is also really good for inflammation. You get turmeric, which is good for inflammation. You get so many good herbs and spices and stuff in there, and then you compare that with brown rice or something because your gut loves fiber. But not only – I don't even stop at brown rice. I start chucking quinoa at the end because that takes like two minutes to – I have this like grain blend – or something like fricas, some of the old grains that you can get. You can have that with the curry. Um, you can, if there's leftovers the next day, you can roll it up in a um, tortilla and and yeah, throw it in the air fryer, and then you have a little roll for lunch, and then, or you, with a salad even. And, oh. What do you do yeah. to then move your body? Like, what's your kind of way to add? Ah. Well, every morning I get up early and walk the dog and that's like about waking your brain up, just getting out in the sunshine. Um, so I, I walk the dog, but he's getting old so he doesn't walk that fast anymore. He's just out there to follow his nose, the silly thing. But, you know, a little stroll around the neighbourhood first thing. Um, we run villas up here in Calberry, so I'm often cleaning villas, which is a lot of, you know, movements and wakes off. <laughs> yeah. Um, and at the moment, I'm training for a four-day hike through the Murchison Gorge. Oh, wow. Um, so a couple of mornings a week, I get up early and throw a 10-kilo pack on my back and then go and walk like six to eight kilom- kilometres with this heavy pack. I've got some final four questions. So what is your favourite place? I think Calberry. I hate leaving. I'm like, I have, <laughs> people ask me to go to Perth and talk to students and I'm like, oh, but it'll be cold down there and it won't be able to go swimming <laughs> what's your favorite word so this could be like one you love to say or it's silly or it means something like what's your favorite word I think my favorite word is belong you know how you can belong to a family or belong to 
a sports group or a craft group or a reading group or something or you um the the way the aboriginal peoples use the word belong as in the land they belong to the land so that's a complete reversal of um way we see ownership it's belonging to the land you can't not belong to the land if you're born to the land and you belong you belong forever so what was your favorite children's book um my favorite picture book growing up I think was uh, Margaret Mahi's The Lion in the Meadow do you know that one I do it's actually a classic. Yeah. it's a classic because um I because I used to read to my little brothers so they always just loved the ending on that book and what's a good piece of advice you've been given um I, I always feel guilty for past me the things I've done wrong in the past so um I think it's Maya Angelou said when you know better do better yeah and kind of just forgive yourself for who you were in the past but when you know better do better and that's achievement yeah oh well thank (laughs) you so much for your time and being part of kids book buzz it's been so wonderful chat to you um and really to again deep dive back on the raven song and i'm so excited to read the apprentice witnesser and your new stuff coming out as you're working on it um so thank you for being our incredible guest today brian really appreciate it Uh, thank you for having me and thanks for um having such a healthy sponsor i'm really excited about yeah eating eating healthy and being healthy i'm gonna have to make a really big curry tonight that's like my (laughs) my goal now yeah um and to all those who listen thank you happy reading exploring and creating and just thank you again brian for your time thank you so much